Those of you who like a sermon title, I've got a title for you today. And it's something like related to the children's story. And the title is, Who's Afraid of the Biggest Loser? Who's Afraid of the Biggest Loser? Recently, uh, (coughs) talking to a man from America, he informed me that to call somebody a loser in America at the present time, and remember these little terms have their cycle of fadism, don't they? To call someone a loser in America at the present time is to indicate that he's the greatest rubbish that, uh, that could possibly be. He's hit, the, he's hit the dirt, he's in the gutter, um, he has nothing, got nothing to contribute, he has no self-worth, he's nothing. And uh, so to call one a loser in America at the, pr- at the moment is, uh, is probably an extremely insulting thing to do. So I've taken the word loser because uh, of that connotation that it has. I suppose for us, when we talk about someone being a loser, we, we don't really mean it quite that bad. They're not absolutely beyond it. But, uh, you know, it means different things in different places, some of these words, don't they? And we've got some of the words that, that uh, we use as well. And uh, some of them indicate the similar sort of thought. So who's afraid of the biggest loser? <coughs> Pardon me. Let's have a look in the book of Isaiah. I think you'll catch on very quickly who the biggest loser is that I'm talking about. And I'm going to Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, and it has a parallel passage in the book of Ezekiel, which is double the chapters, and it's Ezekiel 28. So you can roll over to there if you want to. And uh, I want to refer to these two references for just a moment in relation to the greatest loser. Isaiah chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse, uh, um, what did I put down? I just want some of these verses. Verse 12. And uh, here uh, Isaiah, in a poetic form, he's really talking about the king of Babylon, but he's using a description of someone who believed he was going to be the king of the world. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And so uh, in a uh, double application, Isaiah sees the king of Babylon, who was a bad character, and he was going to be cut down, and uh, Babylon was going to be destroyed. But at the same time, he gives us an insight into Lucifer. Lucifer who thought he was so great, and in fact one time was, (coughs) he's cut down and he's become a loser. And the reason is given, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, which is an old-fashioned saying to mean in the place of control. And so Lucifer decided that he would take on the role of God. He could do a better job than God. Now we say to ourselves, that's arrogance, isn't it? You wouldn't be sitting in this church today, I suppose, unless you believed that God was a great deal superior than uh, to yourself. If you think that you can, do it, you can do a better job than God, come and see me afterwards and we'll see if that's correct or not. And uh, you can probably do a better job than me in some things, and I'll acknowledge that, okay, but it's going to be hard for me to believe that you can do a better job than God. But Lucifer, a man who's in, uh, uh, an angel who's been in high position in God's courts, now says, I can do a better job than God. I'll ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I'll be like the Most High, he says. I'll be like God himself. And we think what? arrogance. Yet sometimes I fear that we think that we know a little better than God and we take things into our own hands and do things without consulting God and under the um, influence of our own ego we find that we're trying to do something um, without God in it and we become a bit of a loser too. And if that persists we will become the loser that Lucifer was. So uh, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then uh, Ezekiel. 
And it's Ezekiel in chapter 28. We just double the chapters. It's easy to find these passages about uh, Lucifer here because we just double the numbers. And reading from verse 12 again, and we read, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. So here's the king of Tyre getting a, 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 a prophecy extended to him, but it's, it's spoken to him in terms of Lucifer. Perhaps I should explain that there was an old poem around about this time, an old poem which described the fall of Lucifer. We don't know what prophet wrote the poem, but there was an ancient poem around which uh, uh, described the fall of Lucifer. And both Isaiah and Ezekiel incorporated this poem into their condemnation of these two evil kings. And luckily they did because it gives us an insight into Lucifer and how his fall came about. And so uh, he says, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And uh, this is an expression to say, um, you were, the, you were the, the greatest and the completest of all the, all the angelic hosts. You are full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You know, sometimes we get a picture of Satan, the old serpent, the devil, called other than Lucifer, and we get a picture of him. In fact, he's almost always portrayed as being that old dragon, the one who has the uh, horns on his head, scales down his back, a long tail with a spike and a barb in the end of it, and he always carries a great pitchfork, and he's standing somewhere near a great hot fire. And we get this picture of him, but that's not the picture the Bible gives of him. It says, you were perfect, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You've been in the Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, and it lists all those stones down there, and then it talks about his singing ability. His voice, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. God put him in his high position and so on. You were perfect in your ways, verse 15, from the day that thou were created until iniquity was found in you. And so Lucifer, this beautiful being, was perfect, admired, had a marvellous place to live, and uh, he uh, was discovered to be evil. I don't think it suggests that he was evil from the start. I think it is to be understood that Lucifer developed an evil tendency because somehow, somewhere in his experience, he started to think things about God that were not correct. Things that he could not substantiate. And as he thought about God and compared God with him, he started to think to himself, God and I are so near equal that I'm really, uh, I'm under, under esteemed. I am under appreciated. And as he looked at God, of course, what he saw was Jesus. For Jesus was the representation of God in physical form. And as he saw Jesus doing his work as he did to, to create and to maintain creation and so on, he came to the conclusion that he was himself underestimated. God was holding something back from him. If I was just given my free hand, I could be as good as God. And if I took over this universe, I would make things much easier for everybody. First of all, I'd get away from this law thing that God has, this rules that we all live by. I'd get the people, I'd get the, uh, the angels away from having to keep a lot of rules and laws because they have good minds. They can think for themselves. And so he started to doubt the great qualities of God and attribute to God in some way some little hint of selfishness. And so here is the description of Lucifer. A person, a being, <coughs> I keep calling him a person, a being, an angelic being. Verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. 
and I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings and they can behold you. In other words, I will throw you down and all the world will one day look upon you with disgust and they will see that you are the greatest loser in the universe. So here's a picture of Satan, the greatest loser in the universe. From fame to fall. And Lucifer loses every good thing that he had. It seems to me as though Lucifer may have had the job of leading the angelic choirs as they praised God. And a little hint of that seems to be in the book of Revelation and other places where angelic choirs praised God from time to time, particularly on the Sabbath, but at other specific times when God did something uh, memorable, something that could be well worth and is recorded in Scripture, there's angelic choirs singing there. There are hosts, it says, thousands and thousands of them. And Lucifer seems to be the one who leads in the angelic choirs. Lucifer perhaps sings uh, 810, uh, 816, or perhaps uh, 32 parts with his one voice. When I was young, I used to try and sing two parts at once. And uh, I never did succeed. It became something like a yodel. And uh, it just didn't work too well. So uh, now when you hear me singing, you'll only hear me singing one part at a time because I'm content with that. Lucifer seemed to have some great abilities and was proud of it. He was proud of his beauty in time. He became proud of his beauty. Rather than to appreciate his beauty, he became proud of it. You see, in themselves, these things are not wrong. It's not wrong to have a marvelous singing voice. It's not wrong to have a marvelous ability with music or with art or with something like that. It's not wrong to look beautiful. And uh, <coughs> oh, I'd be quite happy if I looked a lot more handsome. It would suit me all right. And, uh, but you know, uh, there's always the risk, isn't it? There's always the risk that I look in the mirror every morning and I see someone so handsome that I think he's a little better than the guy across the road who's scarred and marred and come back from the Korean War or something or other. And he's showing all the signs of having a hard time. There's a risk. Satan took those good things that God in, endowed him with and became proud of them. And hence he became the world's greatest loser. In fact, in the universe, in the universe, Satan is the greatest loser in the universe. You know, there's a lot of Christians who have become afraid of the greatest loser. It's sad to find that some Christians are afraid all the time that the devil will somehow get them beat. I'm sure that when I prepare people for baptism that I spend time convincing the candidate that now they have given their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, they have need not need any fear of Satan because Satan is the loser. And if we're going to have any satisfaction in our Christian experience, we're going to have to know that Satan is a conquered enemy. We have to know that Satan will not necessarily have power over us, that he cannot have power over us, in fact, if we keep near to Christ. Nowhere will you find that Satan had power over anybody when Jesus was present there. You'll record the story. We touched on it, didn't we, almost uh, this morning. When Jesus came down off the mountain from the transfiguration and there the disciples had been working with a, uh, a man who was a young man evidently who was possessed by a demon and uh, he threw himself into the fire and he injured himself and did all those kind of idiotic mad things and uh, the disciples couldn't get rid of the demon but when Jesus came Jesus cast the demon out. You see uh, <coughs> the devil has no power when Jesus is there. Some that we talked about in Sabbath school this morning, it says that they had demons and the demon had caused their illness. Demon had caused their illness. Not everybody has an illness, has a demon. Don't think that. that that's a fallacy. 
But uh, there are some illnesses that the devil does bring upon people. As a result of their demon possession, they become uh, ill in various ways. And when Jesus comes on the scene and touches them, uh, the demon has to depart. The devil's influence is gone. And so I believe that when we as Christians think about our life, our daily life and experience, we need to remember constantly that the devil is a loser and that he will not have power and control over us. <clears throat> the thought came to mind as I was preparing this sermon of a conversation that my mother had many, many years ago with uh, a very lovely uh, Christian lady. I hesitate to tell you she was a member of the Wangarei Church. I'll tell you that, that much. She was a member of the Wangarei Church. And they met up somewhere, and mum was quite friendly with this lady, and they met up somewhere, I don't know whether it was at one of those old Dorcas meetings they used to have or some sort of regional meeting or somewhere anyway. They met up and they were talking together and so on. And, uh, and they got talking <coughs> about uh, uh, being influential in their community some way. And, and uh, this lady said to mum, do you belong to anything? And uh, mum said, well, I... Um, I do go and play the piano for the Methodist church sometimes and I do go and help people with their weddings and their family things. And she said, I, I've joined the, the Country Women's Institute and about once in two months I'm able to get along to the Country Women's Institute. And this good lady said to mum, I'd love to do that. And mum said, well, I'll give you a contact and you contact so and so and so and so and you'll be able to join the Country Women's Institute where you live. And this lady said, oh, I'd love to. Mum said, well, why don't you? And the lady said, I I'm afraid to, she says. Mum said, well, are, you, are you a shy person? Are you too shy to join with the Women's Institute? They're not so terrible at Women's Institute, are they? I'm sure some of you people have gone to Women's Institute. I don't know if it's very strong these days. And uh, the good lady says, she says, I I'm afraid to. And, and mum says, well, look, tell me what's so frightening about it. She says, I'm afraid that somebody, the devil might tempt somebody to offer me a cup of tea and I take it. And you laugh and shake your head a little bit. You see, this is the kind of way some Christians are living. Some Christians are living in fear of everything that, that, that they do, that the devil is going to jump out and tempt them to do something wrong. And their whole spiritual experience has a shadow over it because they're constantly afraid of the world's, the universe's greatest loser. Why should we be afraid of the big bad wolf when he's already been conquered? The book of Revelation tells us so clearly that <coughs> he is a conquered foe. You know, sometimes we see the picture of the devil being conquered only in physical terms. And we see the devil over there and we see Jesus there. And the devil is there tempting Jesus uh, out in the wilderness there and he's standing face to face with Jesus and they've had this little discussion. And uh, he is there in physical form and Jesus eventually overcomes his temptations and he, he virtually announces that Satan, you are a loser, you're out of here. And uh, so Satan goes... And it's only physical, but that's not where it's really at. It's not physical, it's mental and it's spiritual. It's mental and it's spiritual. And some Christians have a problem with that aspect of their Christian life. <clears throat> the Christians have fears and, and phobias about Satan. When I was young, I used to dream about Satan. I don't know why. I wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist then. I suppose we read some book somewhere or other or we were told some stories or something or other. And of course my grandfather being an Irishman frequently talked about the devil and uh, when things went wrong the devil featured very strongly along with a lot of other language and the place where the devil was going to take you and uh, so on and so perhaps we got a little uh, intimidated about the devil but I could picture the devil, not uh, the typical picture of him as that dragon-looking creature with his big uh, claws holding this big uh, spear and whatever, but more the picture of some big black panther kind of a thing. And it was the devil. 
and uh, this big black panther kind of thing was always coming up the steps in the old porch and uh, for some reason he was coming to get me. I don't know why I didn't like the rest of the family but he was always coming to get me and I'd wake up in the middle of the night sometime uh, boiling my head off and I was always uh, sitting uh, beside uh, dad usually sitting beside the old wood stove and uh, of course I was having these nightmares in my sleep. Probably had the wrong kind of tea or ate too much for tea or something. I don't know what the cause of it was. But, uh, <coughs> you know, in the spiritual realm sometimes we have those same kind of pictures that the devil is so powerful and strong that uh, I need to be in fear of him constantly. I suggest to you that we should not be afraid of him, but we should be aware of him. We'd be far better to be aware of him than to be afraid of him. You know, if you're afraid of something or somebody, you've acknowledged in your mind that they're greater than you. And if I say that I am afraid of someone, any one of, of you or anyone else out there, I'm afraid of them, I am acknowledging in my mind that they are greater than me. They have power over me. And therefore, they intimidate me and I feel afraid. And when you consider that the devil has lost his fight in the... <coughs> in the universe to Jesus Christ why aren't we then claiming the power of Jesus instead of being worried about the power of the loser <clears throat> you see in the physical aspect there is the physical fear the physical presence of Lucifer of Satan the devil, the slanderer. He's got various names. Some people fear the physical presence. The more primitive a society is, the more they fear the physical presence of some evil being. For those who are more educated, there is the imaginative fear. The imaginative fear that uh, the devil might appear to me in some form or another and do me some harm. And then there is, of course, the mental fear. For some there is the mental fear that the devil is doing all these things to me, that's why my mind is not working as well. If my mind would only work as clearly as I would like it to work, um, I would be happy, but I know that the devil is doing something in my mind. You know, that kind of thing drives people eventually to insanity. We want to remember always that the devil is not allowed to dwell in your being if you've invited Jesus Christ into your being. The two of them cannot abide together. And if you've invited Jesus into your being today, the devil has no room there. And uh, <coughs> so you need not fear that. And uh, then, of course, there is the fear that uh, the devil might take control of me and uh, I will become a lunatic. That's a fear that some people have who are involved in practices that are not normal for Christian people. Often they're personal practices that are not normal for good Christian people. And eventually they develop a fear that the devil will take control of them somehow so that they will become an idiot, a, uh, a lunatic. If we have Jesus Christ and take his power into our life every day, that fear is unwarranted and unrealistic. There is no fear of that at all. When we give up practices that cause us harm, um, there is no fear that... The devil will turn us mad. And then there's the spiritual fear. People fear the devil sometimes that he will destroy their spiritual life. He will destroy the relationship that they have with God, with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And uh, they fear that the devil somehow will make me sin. I'm interested in a little statement that Ellen White made. She said, we very often blame the devil for sins for which he is not responsible. We very often blame the devil for sins for which he is not responsible. Or not responsible of causing, that's what she means. 
You know, sometimes we think to ourselves that we will do thus and so, and the little small voice tells us that's not the way to go, it's not the way to do it, and uh, yet we go ahead and do it anyhow, and then we turn around and we say, the devil made me do it. And God gave us a mind, and he gave us reasoning, and he gave us information, and he gave us the ability to call upon him who is more powerful than the loser, Satan. And uh, he expects us to exercise that and to make judgment calls and to make decisions that would be in harmony with Christian principle. Let's not blame the devil for things that, uh, that uh, we are responsible for ourselves. And then, of course, we have the fear, and this is the fear in that illustrative story that I just told you, that uh, the devil will come to me in some way or another and he will tempt me to do something whereby I will deny my Lord. Well, you might think that having a cup of tea um, at the Women's Institute is a very mild example. But for someone who has this kind of constant fear in their mind, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. This lady hadn't had a cup of tea for years and years and years. And... Uh, <coughs> She had made it a principle that she did not abuse her body with the use of tea and coffee, and if they'd had Coca-Cola, she wouldn't have had that either, and all a lot of other things. And good on her, too, for making that stand. But to be fearful, fearful of being associated with people because they might tempt you via Satan to do something wrong is a misplaced fear. Because the very association with others as a Christian, will actually strengthen your spirituality rather than weaken it. Now, I'm not talking about going out to have entertainment for sheer pleasure. That's different. But to go out to mix with other people, to try and give them something of the gospel. The Lord says he will be with us, doesn't he? He told the disciples to go out to all the worst places of the world. He said, go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Go to the worst parts of the world, he said. And he didn't leave it there, did he? He put a little phrase at the end. And I will be with you. I will be with you. Let's not be in fear of Lucifer. Lucifer is the loser in status. Revelation 12. And I just want to take a few references from the book of Revelation before I close. Because the book of Revelation is a book that Seventh-day Adventists particularly like. And uh, we love this uh, book. We don't understand it all. And uh, we're still working hard with the book of Revelation. But uh, we're finding in it at least one very important thing. And that is Jesus Christ is the conqueror. Without doubt over all the powers of evil. Revelation chapter 12. And uh, I'm reading from verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, who was the dragon? The dragon was cast out, it says. Verse 9, And he is called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And uh, here we see that Satan loses his status. Satan is no longer the covering cherub. Satan no longer has the powers that were granted to him when uh, he was the covering cherub called Lucifer, Satan has lost his status. He's lost his place in his standing before God and before the holy angels. Let's take comfort that Satan has lost his status. Revelation chapter 1, and uh, that's easy to find, isn't it? Chapter 1 and uh, verses 4 and 5 and verse 8 which says, John is writing to the seven churches, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne and, before, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince or the highest of the kings of the earth. And so here Jesus is pictured as one who was and is and is to come. He is a living Jesus. Satan has lost his, <coughs> he has lost his power uh, over that great enemy. And that great enemy was death. 
Satan has lost his power over death. For Jesus rose from the grave and he is the first witness, the most important witness of the power of God to raise people from the dead. And uh, he it is, the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The one in verse 8 who is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, which is and which was and which is to come. Satan has to acknowledge that Jesus has conquered the enemy of all mankind. That is death. Satan, who was the master of death, has lost the power of it. Be thankful that Satan has no power over death. And when that, uh, <coughs> that uh, cessation of life comes to the Christian, it's not death in the same terms as that of the unsaved. It's called so often asleep. Let's rest comfortably in that thought. He lost in the area of philosophy. Satan's philosophy fails him. His philosophy of life, be able to live without the authority of a great God, um, uh, has been lost. Revelation 18 and verse 4, and we read, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. And here is a passage which tells us there will be a call given for people to come out from a philosophical system that will lead people into <coughs> eternal damnation. Satan had set it up. And he set it up in the kingdoms of this world and in the religions of this world. And the call is for people to come out. God doesn't call people to come out unless they can come out. If they can't come out and they won't come out, there would be no good calling them out. And so God calls them out. The angel here is calling people to come out because the philosophy of Satan has failed. And the end result of his philosophy is destruction for himself and all his followers. <clears throat> his kingdom falls. Many are going to choose a philosophy which is the philosophy of life. The lifestyle principles of Jesus Christ, which in, in uh, short are the principles by which the God of heaven rules his universe. The great principle of love, love for God and love for our fellow men. Satan has lost also in the political arena. The nations at the close of time are one day going to acknowledge that God was right and that Satan's philosophy is wrong. He is a political loser. If you trace the history of uh, God's people down through the Old Testament, you'll see from time to time there are specific points where Satan thought he'd gained a great victory. For instance, at the slaughter of Abel, he thought he had gained a great victory because he had killed off the leading descendant of Adam and Eve the God-fearing descendant of Adam and Eve. But of course God outwitted him and Eve had another son. And he became the leader of those people who served God. And then you come to the flood and we discover there that uh, at the flood Satan thought God will never be able to save this world. They are all so evil. But God finds eight people whom he protects in a boat and sets them off floating across the most enormous seas that have ever flooded the world. And he saves his world with a handful of people. And those people eventually end up as uh, <coughs> the descendants of faithful Abraham and they end up in Egypt. And in Egypt it seems as though all knowledge of the true God is going to be obliterated from the minds of the children of Israel. The only person that seems to have it right is a way out in the wilderness, and uh, that's Moses. And he's too far away to influence his people, and he's out there anyway because he's acted criminally and has murdered somebody, and so he's out there for the sake of his hide. He's not going to come back to Egypt and become a leader and a teacher of God's people. But God brings Moses back, and he becomes a leader, a teacher, 
a releaser, a saviour of God's people, and they become a great nation of people. Then you come to uh, the exile of the people in Babylon. And while they were in Babylon for 70 years, the devil was determined that none of those people would ever again go back to their promised land of Canaan and set up their temple at Jerusalem and ever become a people in their own right again. But with the change of nations, they return again and the Jewish people are again a witness, even with their fluctuations, are a witness to the power of the true God. Jesus comes on the scene and Satan says, if I can get rid of Jesus, Jesus is the true witness. He's the one who truly represents humanity. If I can get rid of him, then the truth about God will be wiped out of this world. And so he has Jesus crucified on a cross. But Jesus is crucified and rises again, victorious over everything that Satan can bring against him. And Satan loses politically. And uh, you can read about it in, in uh, Revelation 12 and 13, 14, 16 and so on as you read through. But I want to assure you today that Satan is a loser forever. Revelation 20 and verse 10 we read, <clears throat> And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. A very brief description of the destruction of Satan himself. The greatest loser is annihilated in the fire that destroys all evil. Why then aren't we living our lives free from the fear of Satan? Is there any reason to live in fear that God cannot keep us and hold us uh, safely from Satan? I believe that we have every reason to know that Jesus is with us. Jesus has met our accuser. He has conquered death. Jesus' love for us has been proved to be unending and will never fail. He has made us into his representatives, for he has told us we'll be kings and priests unto God. We'll be his representatives. He has given us his spirit to guide us and to give us the ability to learn and to know and to discern. And as members of his church, we need to grab every opportunity of using those <clears throat> heavenly beings in our, in our walk. He is always uh, at the door of the heart. And all these uh, thoughts come out of the book of Revelation. He's always at the door of our heart. He is always knocking there. He's always waiting to come in. He's always ready, ready to come and give us the advice, the help, and the comfort and the assurance that we need. And he will give us freely and plentifully all that we need in order to be acceptable and pleasing to him. Why then should we be afraid of the universe's greatest loser? You can have the benefits of being free from fear as you live your Christian experience by opening the door of the heart and inviting Jesus into your heart day by day, maybe several times a day, do it until you are assured absolutely that you can walk your day without the fear of the world's greatest loser jumping out at you and putting you off your course and off your track. Let's live in the confidence of Jesus Christ, for he's the winner. We don't have to worry about the world's greatest loser. Let's sing a hymn to close. Um, I believe it's 316, I think it is, in your hymn book, if you're using a hymn book. Live out your life within me, Jesus, King of Kings. <laughs>